There's always something new and exciting happening in Montgomery County, Maryland. Join podcaster and business leader Kelly Leonard and me, Bob Levy, on another episode of Something to Talk About, where we speak with industry leaders making an impact in our county. Just a reminder that Big Mood, Little Mood with Daniel M. Lavery happens twice a week. Slate Plus members get an additional mini episode or Little Big Mood every Friday. Sign up now to listen at slate.com slash mood. Hello and welcome back to Big Mood, Little Mood. I'm your host, Daniel M. Lavery, and with me in the studio this week is Rose Tremlett, who writes a weekly advice and life hack column and co-hosts an optimization podcast for the online edition of the German national newspaper, Die Zeit. Rose, welcome to the show. It's an honor and a privilege to be here, Danny. I'm so pleased that you're here, and I think it's kind of fun and interesting that I was so anxious about pronouncing Dietz Zeit correctly that I ended up mispronouncing <laughs> my own name and the word podcast uh, and had to retake your intro several times, which... They're both very challenging. It's it's fine. It just goes to show that the whack-a-mole principle applies to pretty much any situation that you can think of. And I wherever love that, you're the looking, whack-a-mole principle. <laughs> wherever you're looking for danger, uh, it will pop up right next to it instead. Um, how is that going? How is the optimization guidance for Germans uh, going as a as a sort of pursuit of of life? It's going very well, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been doing the column for for a long while now, or at least it feels long, and uh, and it's a weekly thing. Um, I try to answer reader questions as often as I can, and the reader questions are coming in more and more as time goes on, and uh, it's become a kind of permanent fixture of the weekend section. So that's really cool. And then the the podcast is also is doing great. We're just about to kick off our new season, but um, we've decided to move away from the seasons model and go to just straight every two weeks for the rest of time. And uh, I'm really excited about that because I didn't enjoy taking a break. That was too, I don't like being far away from podcasts. I like to be near podcasts. That makes a great deal of sense. And I have a, a lot of questions about how particularly like Germans write and think about their problems. But I'll save that for for after we've dealt with the first few of, of the problems in front of us today. But absolutely, if you want to say, well, here's how I would advise them if they were German, uh, feel free to bring that up at any point. <laughs> Is that an invitation or a command? Invitation. Invitation. No <laughs> commands. Absolutely no okay. commands. Um, and I, I kind of appreciate that our first question feels to me at least like a real classic staple of the advice column genre, which is just classic heterosexual question of, you know, is this man going to commit? Is he saying one thing and doing another? That somehow it feels so um, perfectly of its own type that it feels rare, even though it is in fact kind of a cliche. Yeah, it feels like the platonic ideal of an advice column question. (laughs) Yeah, and so in some ways, I think that does kind of free us up. And I realized to the letter writer, that's not how their problem feels to them. So I don't want to go in (laughs) with too much just like pure enjoyment. I realize this is also a difficult position to be in and you don't experience your own life necessarily as a type. But yeah, it was sort of classic. And I feel like, yeah, this is what advice columns were made for. So I know this is this is the advice column question that's been asked since the beginning of newspapers, I think. Um, so but Danny, just to just to quickly rewind for a second, you mentioned it was a classic heterosexual problem. Are we sure that this is a, a hetero relationship? I wasn't really clear on that from the wording. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, okay. I edited it down. Ah, right. Okay. That's, from the that's original. a good piece of information. But now that I say that, I feel like 98% sure rather than 100. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I will go okay. back and check. And in case the letter writer says we're gay, I will fix this. Although I, I don't know that it would change my answer hugely. Um, certainly it is uh, heterosexually resonant, even, <laughs> even if the people involved are not two straight people. But uh, as always, it's good to check my work rather than be like, I bet everybody's straight. <laughs> people having this kind of issue could only be straight. Yeah. yeah. No, one, no one who's gay has ever <laughs> been, you know, inconsistent about making promises, certainly. <laughs> the subject here is confused at crossroads. My partner and I have been together for almost two years. I'm 28 and he's 31. 
We've talked vaguely before about moving in together. And when I bought a condo in February, I asked him if he could see himself living here eventually. He said yes. Recently, we've been visiting friends and family across the U.S., and people often ask my partner if he's still living in the same house. He's been at his place for the last eight years. He doesn't own that place, and he lives there with two other men, so it wouldn't make sense for me to move in with him. His response to this question is always some version of, yes, and I'm never leaving my house. This has bothered me and hurt my feelings, as it's often said in front of me. I asked him if we could check in about this. And he said he still feels the relationship is moving towards living together at some point. I asked him then why he keeps saying that he's, quote, never leaving that house. And he said it's a line he's had for all these years. And that opened up a broader conversation about cohabitation. He said he doesn't know what the future holds, if he'll continue to work from home in a year's time, and that the last relationship he had was ruined when they moved in together. And after his ex told him she wanted to move to a different city, their relationship improved. This was also eight years ago. Additionally, he said that he wanted to be able to, quote, disappear and for it to, quote, not be weird. He said that moving in together is not something he's actively running towards, but moving parallel to it. He also said that he likes his house and does not like my condo, which was surprising and hurtful because I had made the decision to buy it partially with him in mind. When he asked for my thoughts, I said that it sounded like he has no desire to move in together at all and I don't know what that means for a future together. He reiterated that he does see us moving in together down the line, but I don't believe him. We respect that we are both independent people, and I don't think our relationship would be destroyed by moving in together. Our relationship has been loving, supportive, and wonderful for the entirety of our time together, but the fact that he is not moving joyfully towards a new chapter of our relationship has me rethinking if this is the person I want to build a life with. We love each other very much, and he has assured me he will get there, but I'm having a hard time believing this. I don't want to break up with him, but I feel like I will need to make a heartbreaking decision, and I don't know what to do. Do you believe him, I think, is maybe an interesting place to start? Oof, do I believe him? Um... Yeah, the letter writer says, you know, he says that he actually does want to move in with me. I'm not so sure I believe him. And I read this, and I feel a, a certain sense of, I think I know what I believe. And so I was just sort of curious what you thought. I think it feels to me like there's a, a quite a few factors that are sort of contingent here. I feel like one of the reasons why he doesn't want to move in right now is the whole condo situation. He doesn't want to move into a place that he doesn't like. There's also a time factor. He doesn't want to move in now. He wants to do it later. Like there's a lot of conditions. And I'm not sure to what extent those conditions are really true or if they're just excuses. I guess that's the point that I'm at is, is this guy making a bunch of excuses and avoiding saying the truth about why he doesn't want to move in right now? Or are these legitimate reasons that as somebody who very much values their own personal space, I could completely see wanting to live by yourself in your house as a legitimate reason for not wanting to move in with somebody. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I feel, I think similarly, I, I think my my sense here actually is I kind of like both of the people in this question, like I I certainly feel like it's clear that the the boyfriend in question is, I think maybe at the most generous reading, unable to be honest with himself right now. And that is limiting his ability to be usefully honest with his partner. But my my sense reading this is he's afraid to say, I don't want to move in with you. Um, And so he will instead say things to other people or say, sure, 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 I like your condo. But then later when it goes from general to specific, he he says, actually, I don't like your condo. Um, and I don't want to necessarily assume that he is just a, an untrustworthy person, but it really seems like maybe he feels like if you're in a relationship with someone and you really love them and care about them and they want something and you don't, it's kind of rude to admit it. And so the nicest and politest thing you can do is find a way to agree with them that doesn't feel quite like lying and then hope that works which is a bad, I think, strategy, but doesn't necessarily mean that he is like malicious, trying to get away with something, uh, maximally a jerk. But it does seem to me like when he says things that he likes about his current living situation, he is specific. He is, you know, like the, the feelings are strong and he can get detailed about what he likes. It's like, I love these guys. I love where I live. I want to live here forever. I don't ever want to leave. 
And then the sort of most that he can muster in the other direction when you try to get him to, you know, really pin it down is sort of like, hey, I I see us moving in together someday. I'm not moving towards it, but I am moving parallel towards it. Like in the old Superman movie, when Clark Kent as a teenager is running alongside <laughs> the train and they don't ever meet because he doesn't ever get in the train, but they're running next to each other. And, and like, you, you can't move parallel to a decision you hope no. to make. Like, that's not... That was... That line really threw me. That just geometrically doesn't make any sense uh, unless we're talking about not true parallel lines, lines that are almost parallel but will at some point converge in a sort of infinite timeline. Yeah. <laughs> but this, I, I think it's so frustrating because I wish that she, or this person, we assume that she's a she, I wish that the that could have been questioned. You know, what do you mean when you say that you're moving parallel to it rather than just insinuating this kind of fantastical Superman scenario is that just rhetoric to try to shut down the conversation or is is he trying to say something here but do it wording it in a really bad and confusing way yeah and i i know i said before that i'm kind of inclined to give this guy some of the benefit of the doubt but it's also really possible to not give him the benefit of the doubt and and where this reads a little bit more like that that wonderful moment where uh princess diana and prince charles were getting asked about their upcoming wedding and they're like and do you love each other and she gets this beautiful look on her face and she's like oh my god of course and it's like well it depends on what your definition of love is and it's just like oh well, that's not gonna go well <laughs> um and you know uh, to the best of my knowledge it didn't um yeah it, it, he, he sounds like he's been put on the stand when you ask him those questions and he's like mm. trying to take the fifth and not perjure himself uh it's like well i to the best of my uh recollection on the night of the 18th i believe likeliest uh, location for me to have been would have been somewhere normal. So, you know, that's a lot of speculation. It is, I think, difficult when you're trying to talk to someone and they are giving you inconsistent answers without feeling like you are a prosecuting lawyer. Like you're, you're, you feel antagonistic. It's like, I don't really believe what you're saying, or I feel like you're sending me mixed messages. And I'm not saying that because I want to force you to get into a fight with me or because I'm trying to pressure you. It's just, you know, you sound specific and normal when you talk about liking the place that you live now. And you sound kind of deranged when you talk about wanting to move in with me. Um, <laughs> and I say, like, again, like, not in a mean way, not in a way that's like, I think you're <laughs> insane, but just like, I don't really, I don't know. Do you think there's a way to say, like, I don't really buy it in a way that's not, like, so straighten up and fly right. Like, it's like, I really do want to know what you want, even if it is at odds with what I want. Like, the goal is not to pretend to agree. The goal is to live honestly together and to figure out if there are meaningful compromises to be made between us or or if there aren't. Totally. I mean, the the feeling that I get in this letter is that there's a, a subtext that this person is trying to gather information from her partner so that they can make life decisions, right? Um, I, I get the sense that this cohabitation thing is kind of a step on a kind of ladder of steps that this person would like to take mm -hmm. with a partner. And so they're trying to figure out whether or not they should decide to continue pursuing this so that they can take those other steps or whether that's, you know, whether remaining in that relationship is going to mean those other steps are also not possible. You know, it might be having kids or moving together to a new city sometime or something like this. And in a sense, it's not really fair for, for him to be putting them in this position because they can't make those decisions without the information of what's going on with this person. And I wonder whether there's a way to express it like that, of just saying, this is interesting to both of us because it affects both of us and how, and it affects the longer term, like beyond the condo, beyond cohabitation, kind of the everything until you're in a coffin one day. Yeah. And so, you know, when I look at this, the sort of general overall picture that I see between he's saying in front of other people often that he never wants to leave the place that he lives. He says that he wants to disappear and for that to not be weird, um, which is sort of interesting. I mean, I, I can relate to that. Like, <laughs> sure. I also enjoy disappearing and having everyone understand it. Um, but, uh, and then like mentioning that the last time he was in a relationship, when the woman moved away, when she left town, their relationship improved. The picture I get is this guy doesn't want to live with you. 
And especially when he's just sort of glossed over like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said I liked your condo, but I fucking lied. Well, hang on though, Danny, because I, I think that that bit's tricky. Yeah. Right. Because the, well, the condo, the condo is there and he's been asked if he could see himself living there eventually. But, but we're also, we learn in the letter that the purchasing decision was made partially with him in mind and that he doesn't like the condo. And I wonder to what extent the the condo purchase was made kind of within the context of this could be our future together or whether it was, I'm thinking of investing in some real estate and there's this cool condo. And how would you feel theoretically just kind of like bouncing ideas around the room whilst looking at various properties and thinking about, you know, sustainable investments? Mm. Um, and I wonder whether maybe he then perhaps later even felt trapped or, or kind of cornered by realizing that this condo is kind of a pre-made future plan that maybe he didn't realize he was signing up for when the purchase was made. I think that's a very generous way to respond, certainly. And uh, I, I, I can understand why sometimes I certainly have had conversations where someone has asked me about a general idea and I thought, yeah, that sounds okay. And then as we got closer to actually making it happen, I, I would have sort of new objections to the practicalities. But I think to me, I think a good rule of thumb is if you're in a relationship and someone asks you a question where you feel trapped, don't lie. Or or rather, don't round up to what you think the other person wants to hear. Like, say, I am not sure. Even if it's uncomfortable or even if that makes the other person a little disappointed. So I, I guess my sort of sense there is like, I can't know his heart and mind why he at first said, yeah, I could see myself living there someday. And then later said, oh, actually, no, I don't like it. But whether he was just trying to be nice at first or whether he felt trapped or or whatever else, I think the most we can sort of ask of other people is that they be to the best of their ability honest with us. And, and, and so I think, you know, whether or not he liked being asked the question, it was incumbent upon him to say, I don't want to talk about moving in together yet or no, I like this condo for you, but I don't want to live there myself at the time. Does that seem like an unreasonable, I, I don't want to be, again, like too hard on him. To me, that just feels like a reasonable expectation to have had of a partner. But do you think, was the letter writer maybe misguided in asking in the first place rather than saying, let's just talk about moving in generally rather than here's my condo? Yeah, I th- I, I think maybe both. Mm-hmm. Um, I think your interpretation is is very reasonable. I I, I think it is entirely reasonable for all of us to expect that our partners are going to be honest with us about how they feel but also I think as you say sometimes we just kind of have a knee-jerk reaction and say something without really thinking about it in the moment and sometimes that happens in a really critical moment where then all of a sudden hundreds of thousands of dollars change hands Mm -hmm. Um, and that's tricky to kind of backpedal on and that's the kind of thing I would do because I'm an idiot. So I can totally sympathize with accidentally helping someone buy a condo and then realizing that I don't want to live in it myself. Mm-hmm. And I do wonder whether in this situation they were looking at this place together, like, is this a place that we want to live in together? Because I th- feel like that, you know, would have been a, a super important contextual thing to clarify when looking at apartments, right? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I feel that this whole thing about him, his last relationship being ruined when they moved in together, that seems really critical because it sounds like he has some some issues around that, maybe some trauma, maybe it was really, really hard. Maybe that's kind of changed the way that he views relationships. And that doesn't mean to say that he has to stick to that and live that way forever, but it does sound to me like he he could do with some therapy or they could do with some couples therapy to maybe help him move move on from this because if he's got this kind of anxiety around cohabitation pushing him into cohabitation is not going to be the solution there yeah I think not to get all like 2005 he's just not that into you Uh, but I do think what I see (laughs) please do what I see in this letter is this is a guy who wants to say no without saying no and again I don't think that means necessarily that he doesn't love you Um, Or that there's no possible way for the two of you to continue to be together for a while longer or or indefinitely. Um, But I I hear, you know, it's not that I don't want to move in with you. It's that I don't really love this condo. It's not that I don't want to move in with you. It's just that uh, I don't know if I'll be working from home in a year. It's not that I don't want to move in with you. It's just the last time I moved in with someone, I didn't like it. 
to me, it's like he he keeps trying to say 12 without saying 12. So he's just like, well, I saw two dozen things. Or, no, that's not 12. <laughs> that's 24. <laughs> like, but <laughs> I saw a dozen things earlier. Or like, oh, I saw a half of 24 things today. Or I saw three fours. And it's just like, yeah, you're saying 12. <laughs> so, you know, how do you bring that to someone without making them feel trapped, I think is a great question. But I think if, if this were me, or, or rather my my suggestion to this letter writer, I think would be, Without that sort of air of like, I've got you now, you son of a bitch, I would just say, you know, <laughs> I, I can appreciate that this maybe is a difficult discussion to have, but my sense, based on what you say in front of other people, is that you don't want to, or at least that you have a lot of really strong reservations. And I just, whatever conversations we have, I, I do want to know at least that you feel comfortable telling me that, and, and, and I want, don't want you to feel like I would rather you say what you think I want to hear. Because that actually makes me feel kind of crazy. I, I would much rather honestly disagree and figure that out or be a little sad or disappointed um, than than just tell each other, like, sure, 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 I think this is what you want. So, like, I don't think you actually tell people who ask you, are you ever going to move out of this place? No, I'm going to live here forever. I, you know, when you tell me you just say that because you're used to saying that, that doesn't really, like, pass the smell test. And so <laughs> I, I, I think you just mean it on some level. Um, and so... Then letter writer, you can kind of think like, does that mean that you want to say, I'm not going to bring up living together anymore. If you change your mind, let me know, but I'm going to operate on the assumption that we're not going to. I think that would be reasonable. Um, if you feel like, ah, oh, I could do that, but I would secretly be hoping he would change his mind and I would feel a lot of anxiety like waiting for that. That might be an indicator that you're getting closer to just a level of incompatibility that you can't really work around. But You've asked him a number of times and you've checked in with him and he's either been evasive or changed his mind without telling you until he felt sort of pushed into it. And I don't think that's a great indicator that he's good at disagreeing respectfully and lovingly. And again, that doesn't mean he can't mm. get better at it, but I think that would be the thing that I would really stress with him. Not just, I want you to want to move in and if you don't want that, we should break up. So much as like, I want to trust that when we have big conversations about our future together, that you're not just going to say what you think I want to hear in the moment and then secretly do something else. Yeah. And if he if his response to that is continuing to be evasive, maybe that's an indicator that you're reaching the end of the line. And I know you said you don't want to break up, but I also can't imagine that you would want to be in a long-term relationship with someone who was constantly saying like, oh, no, no, someday we'll live together. And then as soon as someone's like, hey, you guys ever think about living together? He's like, fuck no. And then he's like, babe, Babe, I didn't mean that. I'm just so used to saying that because of shitty other girlfriends in the past who weren't you. But it, I didn't mean it. Like, that would make me feel nuts. That's true. I I, I think uh, definitely there's a communication issue in this in this relationship. And I think that's sort of weird then that in the in the letter, it says that the relationship is, is essentially, you know, perfect, loving, supportive, and wonderful. It doesn't sound too wonderful if they're not able to have the big, big conversations and be sure that each of them are being truthful on the other hand as someone who's single myself like dating is brutal man you mm -hmm. know and like and we all end up making compromises with who we want to to get together with or stay together with and and also people are experimenting more and more with different ways of having relationships having long-term relationships people are having long-term relationships where they don't live together more and more now and maybe that's a model that could work for the letter writer if they if they were, if they felt that the person was more important than the the plan, so I guess the letter writer needs to sort of also decide whether whether they want to have the plan, but maybe with a person who's not as wonderful as this person, or whether the person is wonderful enough to maybe think about spending time working on the the other stuff that they've got going on, the things that are currently causing friction. Yeah, and just ultimately, like letter writer, there's nothing wrong with wanting to move in with someone. You're not being like weird or too pressury. You're not causing him to be evasive by asking or wanting something. And if anything, it would be good for him just as a general rule to get better at being honest in relationships rather than trying to like keep the peace at the expense of truthfulness. Doesn't mean he could never get better at it. Doesn't mean he's like trying to treat you badly. Just like this is not his best quality, clearly. Um, and so just if you decide I want to move in with someone. I don't want to change my relationship to the idea of cohabitation. That would be fine too. And it would just, 
you would be sad, but you would break up and then you would find somebody else. And I, I guess I'll just kind of end with, if he says he wants to move in eventually, um, he'll get there. That's a question that has a particular answer. So like, again, that means, okay, like when and how? And it doesn't mean he have to, has to have like a 10 point plan. But if it's like, great, when do you think roughly that will be? And he's just like, someday, eventually, get off my back. To me, that would suggest maybe it's it's not quite um, sincere uh, as opposed to like, you know what, in two years, in two years, that'd be nice. And again, then you'd still have to be like, well, do I trust the two years? Does that feel good to me? Would I want to wait that long? And those are all really, really personal questions. I just, I can really understand having a, a, a lot of different relationships to the question of like, when do you want to think about moving in? I don't want to be either like, always you should want to move in at two years or you're weird or not. Just that you're not wrong for wanting to do it. He's not wrong for wanting not to do it. Where I wish he would get on your level is the degree of, here's what I want. I'm willing to be honest about it. I'm not going to say one thing and do another. And I think he's capable of doing that. And if he decides not to be, I wish you a better next boyfriend. (laughs) I think that's all I got for this one. Sorry to both invoke like spectral heterosexuality and then also he's just not that into you which is sort of an insane framework for looking at the world. But uh, sometimes, you know, a little derangement is helpful to all of us. There's always something new and exciting happening in Montgomery County, Maryland. Join podcaster and business leader Kelly Leonard and me, Bob Levy, on another episode of Something to Talk About where we speak with industry leaders making an impact in our county. Would you mind reading our second letter? Absolutely. The subject is former solidarity. Five years ago, I was engaged in the prison abolition movement, not organizing, but following the movement, aims and demands, making regular donations, etc. I signed up through an organization for a pen pal on the inside and corresponded regularly with Jake for about two years. We didn't have a lot to discuss, especially with regards to faith and politics, and I would try to be neutral in tone. I sent letters with words of support, affirmation, holiday cards, and news articles that I found interesting. I knew what my letters meant to him, and frequently turned down requests for phone calls or visitations. His state was very far from mine and required a landline phone for calls. I offered books and gifts, though he turned them down. For no good reason on my part, I stopped responding. I had many excuses pandemic, moving, work stress, frustration in our conversations, other interests, but none of them are fair to Jake. I had a few letters awaiting response and just never got around to it. Jake sent a final letter that apologised for anything he had done, saying he understood the challenges and wishing me well. It's been two years since I last wrote to Jake, and I recently came across a box of his letters. I definitely don't regret being in touch during that time, but I was not prepared to be somebody's emotional support line. I don't necessarily want to restart our correspondence, but I feel incredibly guilty. Is there something I should do? Where do you want to start with this one? I feel like I just talked a lot, so. (laughs) Uh, Well, if I may, Danny, I think I'd like to start with a tangent. Please. (laughs) I think, well, this letter got more and more chewy the more I read and thought about it. Um, And what I ended up thinking about a lot was how when you do a voluntary project, whether that's volunteering work or or activism or um, a community project or something like this, um, and it's unpaid, there needs to be really clear boundaries. And usually those boundaries are given to you. It's like you will do this project until it's finished, or you will do this task, or you will spend a certain amount of hours each week, or we will ask you to do stuff and you'll tell us whether or not you're up for it. Um, But I think with these kinds of things that's like a a buddy program, that gets really tricky because the job is to be somebody's friend, Mm -hmm. but it's not the same as a real friendship because it's the scope is a lot more narrow and you either need to kind of decide on those boundaries yourself and then you have to put a lot of work into enforcing them or ideally the organization that's organizing this should help you to put those boundaries in place and also help to advise you on what those boundaries should be. And what it occurred to me in this letter was that, you know, in this person's defense, I think maybe it, it sounds like they they weren't really given an appropriate kind of briefing on how to have a relationship with this with this Jake person, um, how to be their pen pal, how much of that is being a friend, how much of that is just 
being company um, and what to do if if you feel like that is getting too intense. Because I feel like stopping it outright is not the best way to kind of leave that if it's not working for you. Mm-hmm. But um, but this person should have got support in figuring out what to do if it's not working for them. Yeah. That's my first take, I think. I think that's a really good take. And I, I think I had noticed that uh, as well because the the letter writer had said, for no good reason on my part, I stopped responding. I had many excuses. And again, you know, I don't want to either say, letter writer, don't feel bad about anything. Uh, you know, I rubber stamp every choice you ever made. There's nothing you could have done slightly better. But neither do I think that there's no there there. Um, and yeah, I think I just sort of share your sense of it looks like uh, again, I think it can be great to do this kind of work without necessarily having an organization telling you exactly how to conduct any kind of interpersonal relationship. But as you say, this was not as if the two of them just like bumped into each other and decided to kick up a correspondence. Like you you came to this through an organization because you wanted to be useful. And the two of you didn't have much in common other than you both signed up for this letter exchange. Um, and so, yeah, you know, like I, I had the same sense as you did about like, uh, we didn't always have a lot to discuss. There were like pretty clearly and pretty immediately some big differences in religion and politics that I wanted to make sure not to get into a fight about. Uh, and then also something that I wanted to suggest to him, uh, books and gifts, he didn't want. And something that he did want, phone calls and, and in-person visits, I didn't want. And again, just like like doesn't make these people who run the organization like wrong or bad or evil, just like those are big questions. And if you don't know how to handle those outright, I, I can really see how that would build up. And after two years, then the pandemic and work stress and moving and feeling a sense that there's a lot in our conversations that I don't know how to say or how to politely avoid. Yeah, I could see why just ending the, not writing the letters again, that that felt like this might be the best move available to me. That, that to me was not like, wow, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I mean, I, that my my tangent was also kind of a huge caveat to to the fact that I also I do think that ghosting this person was not a great way to shut down the relationship. Like, I think ghosting is always rude, even if that person is a in prison, and it doesn't really sa- from the excuses. It doesn't sound like this person felt like they were in danger or, or that the the correspondence was particularly sort of upsetting them or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the least they could have done was send them a final message to say, I can't really handle this um, pen pal thing anymore and I wish you all the best. And they didn't do that. And it, and I think this writer feels guilty because I think they know that they didn't ever give Jake that kind of closure and they kind of let him feel like he'd done something wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is maybe not fair. No, I, I, th- I think that's the, the right level of, I, I neither want the letter writer to feel like I did something like, just totally beyond the pale or I've ruined Jake's life. I, I wouldn't go that far. And I think also, yeah, you know, you felt genuine tension for, I think, good reasons and you handled them by avoiding it. I think, again, in part because you felt like all of these issues, uh, what boundaries we have with each other, our big disagreements in faith and politics, as well as like, how long is this relationship going to last? Like, did I sign up for a lifetime of writing to this person? And if if so, does this organization have anything like a sort of like getting to know you period where you sort of suss out like, are we good, uh, you know, letter writing? Uh, Is there chemistry there? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, Yeah, are we a match? Yeah. And so again, I, I think a better possible options would have been maybe asking for some input from somebody at the organization, like, hey, I'm having trouble around like these three issues and I'm not really sure that I want to continue writing to Jake. What scripts or like what suggestions do you have for winding things down? Can you get Jake somebody else to like kick it up um, to like start a new letter writing relationship while I let him know that I'm not going to be available anymore? There were other options available to you. So just again, doesn't mean you're a monster just like yeah, the reason you feel a little guilty is because you chose avoidance rather than something else. And I, I think this can help you look for what are other ways uh, in the future that if I'm in a similar position, whether that has to do with volunteer work or interpersonal stuff, um, I cannot do that. But then there's also the question of two years later, 
do you think my, my inclination is like it would potentially be more weird or disruptive if you were to write to Jake after two years and say, hey, sorry, I still don't want to be pen pals, but I should have told you why. And it was because we had all these disagreements and now I still don't want to talk to you. Goodbye. Like to me, it feels like leave this one alone, but I'm open to other ideas if you have them. Well, I think if the penultimate sentence said, I feel slightly guilty, I would, I would be a hundred percent on board with what you're saying of just kind of let, let it lie and move on with your life and maybe volunteer for something where it's a little bit clearer what you're actually expected to do. But, um, but, but this person says they feel incredibly guilty. Like this seems to be really, um, weighing on their shoulders. And in a sense, I, I got the sense from this letter that this person is asking a little bit, should I be feeling guilty or can you help me to kind of absolve myself? And I think I'm getting the sense from you. I, I feel like I, I don't want to completely absolve this person. Like I, I totally understand that they were in a difficult situation, but I also think they could have handled the situation better. And I think they weren't supported enough, but I think it doesn't sound like they sought out support either. So maybe that guilt is is in part justified. And I think one option would be to just feel that, you know, and kind of accept that you did a cruddy thing by ghosting this guy and like, you can feel bad about that, but you don't have to feel tortured by it. It's just, we all do cruddy things sometimes. But if you really want that, I think if you want to kind of alleviate that sense and feel unburdened by it, it might be nice to get in touch and just explain why you stopped writing. Let Jake have that closure of knowing that that you didn't just suddenly decide you hated him, but that it didn't work with your schedule and the pandemic and all these things. I think maybe if Jake apologized for stuff that he hadn't done, it would be nice to kind of to absolve him of any of anything that he apologized for that he didn't do. Mm -hmm. And maybe just say, I do wish you the best and I'm really sorry for falling out of touch. But FYI, I'm not going to be responding to any follow-up letters or anything like that. Just to give Jake that opportunity to close that, to close that chapter for him, but also make it clear that this is not the beginning of a new pen pal ship. I don't know what the noun is, but what yeah. do you think? You know, now that you say that, I think that I, I do have a sense of what I would advise the letter writer to do first. And that would be, I think, get in touch with that organization that assigns people pen pals and just say, you know, here's what happened. Some of our conversations were meaningful. Some of them were kind of anodyne. And sometimes I felt kind of uncomfortable because Jake often wanted to meet uh, and I didn't. And, you know, in retrospect, I wish I had asked you for support sooner. But now I I'm wondering, I'm considering reaching out again, but I know I don't want to become his pen pal again. Um, and so I'm not also sure if that would potentially be, you know, doing him more harm than good. Do you have any suggestions? Um, and if I had come to you at the time, would you have been able to advise me better than I was able to advise mm. myself? Because hopefully, you know, there is some expertise there or, or at least some shared experience of like, how do you conduct interpersonal relationships that are also done in this kind of like, it, there's also an element of like volunteer work and charity here. So it's it's also not just that people are like meeting as friends and equals. Like there's also a real difference in why you're coming to it, right? Like one of them is I am out of society in a number of ways um, and I would like to resume contact with somebody who's in society. And another one could be any number of reasons. Could be, I think it would be, you know, meaningful or I think it would make me feel good or you know, would align with my values, but it's it's not the same level of like need, if that makes sense. So that's why I would just want to encourage the letter writer, like get outside suggestions and help before proceeding. Because again, I don't think this is going to be the worst thing that's ever happened to Jake, but I do also want you to be able to be to the best of your ability, as considerate of his position as you can without going so far in the other direction that it's like, it's also okay if on reflection you think, you know, the fact that he kept asking to meet in person when I kept saying no really made me uncomfortable. And again, that doesn't mean the ghosting was the right move, but like it might push you in the direction of deciding I actually don't trust my ability to get in touch with Jake again and to draw a boundary if he did take that letter as great, let's start writing to each other again. Because I think if you did, write to him. And he said, great, let's be pen pals again. 
if you don't feel confident in, I would be able to calmly and clearly say no. And I would not feel guilty about getting back in touch just to reiterate, I don't want to know you. Then it would be better not to contact him at all. Does that seem reasonable? I feel like that's just a sort of like, that would be a worst case scenario I would like the letter writer to avoid. Yeah, I agree. I think if you're going to get in touch with Jake at all, you need to make the premise crystal clear that this is just to get in touch to say, I apologize and you didn't do anything wrong. And and from now on, I will not be answering any letters. You can't leave that open. And if you don't feel comfortable with being that crystal clear, then maybe don't say anything at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially because I just wonder if the letter writer, do you genuinely feel that Jake didn't do anything wrong? Or, again, I don't know. There's not quite enough detail here for me to say. I don't know how the letter writer responded in terms of being asked again and again, will you come visit me? But, like, it may be that you feel that Jake did do something wrong. And if you don't feel comfortable saying that because you also feel guilty about what you did wrong and the fact that one of you is incarcerated and one of you isn't, that also really puts a strain on your ability to speak honestly. So just, again, if you feel like, I actually don't think he didn't do anything wrong. I just feel really guilty and like I did something worse. That's another reason to potentially consider what you would have done differently. Don't try to reopen this particular wound, but then think a little bit more carefully about any future work that you do that might involve like inter or just like maybe pen pal work is not for you. You know, if you want to ever like mm. get additionally involved in anything that has to do with working with incarcerated people, there's plenty of stuff that you can do that does not involve like personal one-on-one -on -one relationships um, and where you will maybe feel more able to, I, I think this is the problem with a lot of like anything that kind of shades between activism and volunteer work where it's sort of like, well, I'm just giving of my time and my energy freely. So it's not work. So, uh, you know, but it's also not my social life in the same way that just hanging out with my buddies and going to the movies is. So oftentimes people feel like, They'll just do it as long as it feels kind of intuitive. And then when it gets tricky, there's not a lot of like social scripts that they can lean on for saying no or I want to scale back. So they'll often just vanish. I think this is like a common problem with, you know, some kinds of mutual aid, some kinds of volunteer work, some kinds of charity work, some kinds of activism. It's like if people feel like they are volunteering, they don't always know how to ask for help or support. And they'll go from, this is a great idea. I really like the idea of this to this is harder than I thought it would be. And it makes me uncomfortable in ways I don't know how to get help for. I'm going to go. Absolutely. That's so true. And I think, again, I think it's really a shame that this person didn't get proper structured support from the organization. Because like, and I'm speaking from experience here, if you're doing the kind of volunteer work that involves like very close supportive contact with a single person or a few people that you get to know really well it's really hard to separate you know the work uh, quotation marks that you're doing from your kind of natural instinct to want to just do whatever you can to help a person who needs help mm -hmm. and just for one example i was for, i was a teacher volunteer a teacher volunteer once all i was supposed to be doing was teaching the people that i was working with but they they asked me to help them win it in a bunch of other ways, you know, and it was really hard for me to say no to that because I liked them and I saw that they needed more support than they were getting. But, you know, ultimately it ended up consuming huge amounts of my time, huge amounts of my emotional capacity. And you need someone there with you to kind of help you to kind of re rein that in and make it, you know, make it so that it's a manageable thing that you can do that doesn't kind of end up with you setting yourself on fire to keep somebody else warm, as my mom always says. I guess from what you've been saying, one thing that did just suddenly occur to me was, I wonder if this person is feeling guilty, maybe the way that they can kind of express the energy of that guilt would be to actually try to make this better. And maybe they could get in touch with the organization and say, you know, I have some feedback about the pen pal scheme. You know, I, mm -hmm. I feel like there could be a better matching system in place. I'd be happy to volunteer some of my time to maybe put together a, a, a matching uh, like a form or something so that people can say whether they'd be open to visitations, open to phone calls, open to gifts, maybe put down their interests and their hobbies or whatever to help people to find pen pals that they actually vibe with and that that are more on the same wavelength with them. Like I wonder if that's something that you could contribute to help you to feel better about the situation and maybe turn it into a positive. Yeah. I would also feel like, 
again, I don't know much about this organization, but I feel like they should maybe probably also just have like rules in place of like, don't send gifts, right? Like this is a relief mm. organization. Um, and I feel like that would actually maybe be something they would want to be on the lookout for um, or or to at the very least have like real limits on like, you know, again, there's just a lot of ways that that could go like wrong or wonky um, pretty fast. Yeah, and the inmates should be told this is a non-visitation scheme if that's what they've decided to do. Like, don't ask for them because they're never going to happen or something like that, maybe. But yeah, my my sense here is there's a certain degree at play that was also at play in our first letter, which again, some of this is me speculating. So I, I do just want to start with, I don't actually know the heart and mind of the boyfriend in the first letter. But my read of that situation was he was in a position where he felt like Not necessarily because the letter writer was putting this on him, but like he was feeling a certain inner pressure um, of it's not actually okay to say no. If you tell your partner of a year and a half or two years that you don't want to move in together when it's clear that they do, then that means you have to break up or it means you don't really care about them or you have to have a big fight and it's better to avoid big fights. So I'm not going to say no. And I think some of that was at play here too with this letter writer and Jake, which was Jake is asking for things that make me uncomfortable, but I don't want to say no. So I'm not going to say no, but eventually those things are going to pile up to such a degree that I feel like I can't just not say no to him. There's so many things I can't say to him that I can't imagine a continued correspondence. And now I don't have anything to say. So I think that the the problems that we get into when we tell ourselves, I'm not allowed to say no to this person, I have to find a way to politely avoid saying no or to simply like redirect or, or like laugh something off, um, that's often where we get into real trouble. And eventually we find that we have to say no. Um, and if you're not careful about how to do that well, what, what people usually find is the only option that they can imagine is avoidance. And, and I don't think that that's actually a good problem. I just think, or a good solution. I just think sometimes we back ourselves into a corner. So uh, just going to be, I think would be my, my basic criteria is before you consider getting in touch with Jake, get in touch with the organization first. And if you cannot imagine getting back in touch with Jake without recreating the conditions of your first ghosting, like if you're like, if I write to him and he says, great, let's be good friends again. And I can't imagine saying no to that. And I worry that I might avoid him again. Don't contact him. The best thing to do in that situation would be don't recommit the same thing that made you feel guilty several years ago. Um, and that I think is that for me on that subject. So I will stop and ask you instead, what kind of problems do German people write to you about? (laughs) Well, obviously problems involving sausages, um, beer, you know, people getting trapped in pretzels, that kind of thing. Uh, How do you get trapped in a pretzel? (laughs) Well, you know, it's like a finger trap. If you get your finger hooked in them the wrong way and then you can't get it back out. Yes. Then you have to kind of eat it off your hand or whatever. I don't know. It's a whole thing. Of Um, course. Huge problem over here in Germany. Uh, But no, mainly, well, my column is is, is a little bit less ambitious than your podcast, I would say, Danny. Um, It's more about kind of small everyday problems. So, for example, um, how can I stop my drain from smelling really weird? (laughs) Or um, what's the best way to, what's the best way to weigh baking ingredients if I don't have scales on hand? Or how can I make a first date less awkward? You know, teeny little things that you can maybe hack or use a kind of unusual solution for. I mean, I I have to say, not only does that sound fantastic, that sounds plenty ambitious in as much as these sound like solvable problems with real answers where you can feel like I was able to make a genuine change in someone's life today. So that's that's not not ambitious. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good feeling. I mean, I have to say the the comment section generally tends to be more in the direction of this tip is ridiculous and I have the much better tip, which is this. Um, So (laughs) I feel like I'm maybe not solving too many people's problems, but I'm inspiring a discussion about how to solve the problem, which is also possibly a contribution. And listen, not for nothing. It's it's great to get free additional good ideas, even if it's coming from a bunch of really disgruntled Germans saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me try it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, how do you get your trains to smell better, by the way? Oh, um, well, 
This is one of the grossest columns that I've had to write. Uh, so I apologize because the solution is gross. Um, but no, but like, of course, that's the one I <laughs> asked you about, right? Like you mentioned, I was like, I got to know about the gross one, obviously. I know. I re- I'm so full of regrets. Um, well, drains smell because they're either blocked or they've got mold in them, right? So Ooh. the first thing to do is try to unblock your drain if it's not draining properly. And there are ways you can unblock your drain. You can put bicarbonate of soda down them and then tip a bunch of boiling water down after that and that should free up the drain um you can also mm-hmm. stick uh, my one of my favorite things is to get a little an old mascara brush and stick it down the drain and twizzle it a bit and then pull it back up and it pulls all the gunk up with it that's kind of i imagine that's better for sinks than say yes. showers but i love that idea it's quite good for showers with people with long hair <laughs> that then needs to get kind of fished back out although you know how they're always saying you need to change your mascara like every three months or something ridiculous (laughs) because otherwise stuff grows on it. And I I don't wear mascara now, but I used to wear it all the time. And I always found that ridiculous because I was like, my mascara lasts for four years. You could maybe convince me to cut it down to every two years, but no way am I buying fresh mascara every six months. Like I'm not made of money. Um, But it did certainly make me think like, yeah, I guess mascara wands are just like breeding grounds for filth. uh, And I'm going to get pink eye every day. I didn't, to be clear. <laughs> they will be a breeding ground for filth if you use them to clean your drain and apply mascara at the same, in the same tube. Yes, I would never have done that. Uh, I would suggest that you, no, f- maybe finish the mascara first and then use the wand to do drain cleaning. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm totally with you on that. Also, most mascaras these days, the 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 tube thing is like such thick plastic. I feel like it's it's environmentally irresponsible to get a new one every three months that would be an unconscionable waste of fossil fuels but yeah yeah so so you can do that and then uh, going on to the next thing about the drains um once you've unclogged them if they're still really smelly then uh the next kind of trick that you can do is if you take the the grating off of the drain then you have to kind of scrub the edges of the of the pipe because it's usually covered in like a slime and it's that slime that can make the stink Mm. um so that's another use for like a a a round brush like a mascara wand or a bottle brush you can take your bottle brush and just kind of like jam it in there with some dishwasher uh dish detergent and just kind of scrub the pipe clean which is a really unpleasant activity but it does work and and just always good to get less slime in your life i think that's a good general principle i agree um this is very helpful thank you very very much all right, let's get out of here. You got you got German things to do. I got I got places to be. I'm sure. Um, thank you so so much again for your time. And, thank and you for so much for having me. Really thoughtful advice. I'm so grateful to you, and I hope you have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Have a great day, Danny. It's been brilliant. Thanks for joining us on Big Mood, Little Mood with me, Danny Lavery. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Don't miss an episode of the show. Head to slate.com slash mood to sign up to subscribe or hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using right now. Thanks. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know what you think. If you want more Big Mood, Little Mood, you should join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members get an extra episode of Big Mood, Little Mood every Friday, and you'll get to hear more advice or conversations with our guest. And as a Slate Plus member, you'll also be supporting the show. Go to slate.com forward slash mood plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. If you'd like me to read your letter on the show, maybe you need a little advice, maybe you need some big advice, head to slate.com slash mood to find our big mood, little mood listener question form or find a link in the description on the platform you're using right now. Thanks for listening. And here's a preview of our Slate Plus episode coming this Friday. And it is it is genuinely very difficult to apologize well. And, and so, you know, letter writer, you definitely have my sympathy. And I think this is good advice for, for genuinely just about anybody, which is keep your apologies as simple as possible and whenever possible if you're able to edit them and to remove additional emotional context I think that's not always my advice I don't always advise people to like keep their conversations or their discussions or difficult healing 
chats with other people to just like absolute bare minimum. But I do think with an apology, it is easy without even meaning to, uh, to get so into the context or here's why I did it or here's how bad I feel that it puts un- unforeseen pressure on others in, in a way that makes them feel like, well, I, I kind of have to say yes. You've kind of backed me into a corner here. To listen to the rest of that conversation, join Slate Plus now at slate.com forward slash mood. It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at penfed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers' funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. PenFed's got great 